to the uh, Barton Pevel English Literature Department's video lecture on part five of Samuel Taylor Coleridge's uh, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And it's at this point of the romantic, anachronistic, epic ballad that we start to see uh, the, the journey start to change and start to move a little bit more towards home. Uh, part five opens with, Oh, sleep it is a gentle thing beloved from pole to pole. We're starting to see um, after the in sort of intensities of part three and part four, uh, a, a little bit of relief for the man in many respects, that now he is able to rest, okay? Uh, and again, look at how he, was, he is rejoicing in a very natural human earthly pursuit, the idea that you should perhaps be uh, humanity or human civilization should be comfortable in very sort of basic human pleasures. Sleep. Okay, a gentle thing, beloved from pole to pole. A universal truth, perhaps. The idea that there should be unifying absolutes which uh, unite humanity, um, as, you know, along with a love of nature. Uh, it's, of course, at this point that he's able to sleep because finally the, the albatross has been removed from his neck. The responsibility of his crime has been reduced slightly. Okay, so I'm going from the top of page 14 in the Dover Thrift edition. To Mary Queen, the praise be given. She sent the gentle sleep from heaven that slid into my soul. So again, by the mentionings of Mary Queen, uh, we're suggesting perhaps a, a Christian reference, a Catholic reference to to Mary, um, or, or it could be it could be other things as well. But again, uh, the idea that. S supernatural spiritual forces are in control of your your peace your rest your destiny okay. um, slightly odd here the silly buckets on the deck that had so long remained i dreamt they were filled with dew and when i awoke it rained okay so it's interesting there's a kind of a blurringness uh, there's a, there's a, a blurring of fantasy and reality um, in terms of being awake and being asleep and often people have experienced this, that something you're dreaming about is actually happening in the real world. Um, but it seems to be there's some sort of control between the, uh, the state of, of sleep and the state of being awake. Uh, and this, this blurring of consciousness and unconsciousness is what we call a liminal state. Uh, and so liminality in that respect is a, is a key issue, a key theme, a key strand within the narrative. And this has expanded much more as the poem progresses from this point on. Okay. By grace of the Holy Mother, the ancient mariner is refreshed with rain. So he's had sleep and rain, so uh, in terms of having water to drink. Okay. And my lips were wet, my throat was cold, my garments all were dank. Sure, I had drunken in my dreams and still my body drank. So I've been dreaming about getting something to drink to, to quench my thirst, to give me life force, uh, to sort out the chronic dehydration that's been going on. But and then he just keeps on drinking to replenish himself, to restore himself, uh, and it, in many respects, it's restoring his fortitude for the final stretch home. Okay, I moved and could not feel my limbs. I was so light almost. I thought that I had died in sleep and was a blessed ghost. Or well, begging the question: Is he a blessed ghost? Has he been spared because he is of supernatural ilk? Um, who can say? Uh, but again, he can't feel his body, so it's it's, it's detached, it's dehumanised. How in control is he of his own uh, of his own physicality? Um, he heareth sounds and seeth strange sights and commotions in the sky and the element. And soon I heard a roaring wind. It did not come near, but with its sound it shook the sails that were so thin and sere. The upper air burst into life, and a hundred fire flags sheen. To and fro, they were hurried about, and to and fro and in and out, the one stars dance between. So, again, the imagery is very visual in the sky. These fire flags in the sky. It could be lightning, it could be uh, the northern lights, it could be uh, any type of bizarre sort of uh, firework display in many respects is what it resembles. Um, the flags on fire has been analysed by some critics to represent a sort of condemnation of, sort of nationalism and patriarchy and colonialism. Um, that possibly is going a little far, but it's, it's, it's very visual in many respects. 
And the coming wind did roar more loud, and the sails did sigh like sedge, so like how, how like a field of crops would sigh when the wind is rustling through it. And the rain poured down from one black cloud, the moon was at its edge. Uh, again, this is almost now become almost cartoon-like imagery. It's been used so much, it's become hackneyed, and that's, that's many, many respects, all thanks to Coleridge. Um, the thick black cloud was cleft, and still the moon was at its side, like water shot from sci high crag, from some high crag. The lightning fell with never a jagger, river steep and wide. So you're imagining a cloud sort of cut in half by a lightning bolt, uh, a, a sort of a lightning bolt acting almost like a saw, and then water pouring from the sky like a waterfall. Um, now, you know, that imagery now is almost uh, that of Disney, uh, unfortunately, but it is certainly very dramatic. Um, climate-like conditions, so it's pathetic fallacy, it's turbulent, and it's suggesting that these natural weather conditions are affecting the mariner personally and individually. Uh, the lightning fell with never a jag, so if it's not jagged or forked lightning, it must be sheet lightning, so that explains the fire flags and things. Um, and it's almost this river of water falling from the sky, a river steep and wide. Um, you could say, you know, awe-inspiring, sublime-like imagery of a waterfall falling from the heavens, you could argue. The bodies of the ship's crew are inspired, and the ship moves on. So they're inspired and nourished by this natural phenomenon. The loud wind never reached the ship, and now the ship moved on. So how is the ship moving if the wind can't reach it? You know, it's, again, the sails aren't moving, but it moves. So it's disturbing, it's alarming, it's supernatural. Beneath the lightning and the moon, the dead men gave a groan. So they're reanimated, almost like the undead, almost zombie-like. They groaned, they stirred, they all uprose, nor spake, nor moved their eyes. It had been strange, even in a dream, to have seen those dead men rise. Well, of course. Again, we've got rising from the dead here, this kind of bizarre reincarnation, this reanimation. Is this heretical? Um, is this necromancy? Is, is it just zombie fiction? Um, again, it's all of those and none of those. The helmsman steered, the ship moved on, yet never a breeze up blue. The mariners all gan work the ropes where they want to do. They raise their limbs like lifeless tools. We were a ghastly crew. So we're imagining the crew again taking ownership of sailing the vessel, moving around in a habitual way, almost in a trance. Um, and again, slightly undead, perhaps. Again, ghastly crew. It's a horrendous, grotesque, supernatural. The body of my brother's son stood by me knee to knee. Now, brother's son, nephew, okay, stood by me knee to knee. The body and I pulled at one rope, but he said nothing to me. So again, the body of his nephew and him are working together. Is this sort of a, a harmonious portrayal of brotherhood and solidarity, uh, emphasizing the, the, the prestige of the family unit? Or is it showing that, you know, again, the mariner has killed the crew and in doing so has killed a family member, sort of ratcheting up the significance of his, of his crime? Okay. The imagery is odd of knee to knee. It does suggest side by side, advocating brotherhood togetherness. Again, the wedding guest, as the narrative, feels the need to pipe up and interject within the narrative. Again, um, and the, the empathy which readers have with the wedding guest is, is again, reproduced. I fear the ancient mariner, and then the, the mariner is put down almost by, by uh, sorry, the, the wedding guest is put down by the mariner. Be calm, you wedding guest. Twas not those souls that fled in pain, which to their courses came again, but a troop of spirits blessed. Yes, so perhaps the wedding guest feels readers' uh, zombie-like apprehensions of the reanimation of the crew, okay, and starts to say, well, what, you know, what's going on here? And, and of course, it's the idea that it's a troop of angelic spirits who have reanimated uh, the crew. That doesn't make it perhaps any less or more disturbing. But not by the souls of the men, nor by demons of earth or middle air, but by a blessed troop of angelic spirits sent down by the invocation of the guardian saint. Now, is the guardian saint the same as the grace of the Holy Mother that opened the part? These are overlapping and intertwined spiritualities plural within the poem um, which which overlap um, or you know depending on your own faith could be unified and resolved as one okay. 
Um, for when it dawned, they dropped their arms and clustered round the mast. Sweet sounds rose slowly through their mouths and from their bodies passed. So it's almost, are they worshipping the dawn? Our angels are going to have angelic voices praising God, etc. Okay. Around and around flew each sweet sound, then darted to the sun. Slowly the sounds came back again, now mixed, now one by one. Um, I would describe this scene as euphonic, almost this beautiful blend of sounds. We have the crew reanimated by a troop of uh, blessed angelic angels are singing, are making sounds. You think that the sounds, they bounce up to heaven and sometimes the sounds come back mixed by, by, by the great DJ in the sky, presumably, and then they come down again. Now, sometimes they're mixed together, sometimes they're one by one. It's harmonious, it's beautiful, it's euphonic, it's, it's this tra transfixing uh, blend of sounds. Slightly odd, uh, suggesting that it must be one of, of worship, okay? Some, sometimes a dropping from the sky, I heard the skylark sing. Sometimes all little birds that are, how they seem to fill the sea and air with their sweet jargoning. Here we have the angelic voices of the crew bouncing back and sounding like birds. So this suggestion that bird song is akin to angelic voices, is very much Coleridge's pantheistic concerns. It, it's, it's a suggestion that, uh, that nature is angelic, nature is holy. And this is extended in the, the next uh, stanza, where we have the sounds of the angelic uh, crew sounding like instruments. And now it was like all instruments, now like a lonely flute. So we have single noises, blends of noises. Um, individual responsibility, collective responsibility, you could argue. Harmony versus harmony and individualism together. Um, and it's key that we have natural sounds and man-made sounds, and they're both beautiful. And they're both the sounds of angels. They're both holy in that respect. And now it is an angel song that makes the heavens be mute. So even the heavens have stopped talking, the heavens are listening to this fantastic sound, okay? It ceased, yet still the sails made on, a pleasant noise till noon. So, you know, they've gone from dawn until noon, all this sound, it's one hell of a concert. A, no, uh, a noise like a hidden brook in the leafy month of June. Again, the sound of a, a babbling brook, a stream, the ripple of water is, is, is one which is, is relaxing, is tranquil, is beautiful, and in this respect is linked to angels and is therefore holy. Nature is holy, again, that, that moral message reinforced okay uh, a noise like of a hidden brook in the leafy month of june that to the sleeping woods all night singeth a quiet tune so is a babbling brook a stream singing a song nature is singing a tune um has a message has a song has a story has things to teach us okay um and sort of this personification of the brook again it is, it's intertwined with uh, this pantheistic morality. Okay. Till noon we quietly sailed on, yet never a breeze did breathe slowly and smoothly when the ship moved onward from beneath. Now that's slightly sinister. No breeze, yet the ship moves. Now again, the overall control. I think control, responsibility, authority, these are key areas really. How is the ship moving? Um, and of course the side note clarifies that rather helpfully. Um, remember the side note's not added until uh, the early 19th century. The lonesome spirit from the South Pole carries on the ship as far as the line in obedience to the angelic troop, but still requires vengeance. So these sounds that the, the crew were making, was that to command the lonesome spirit to move them? Were they navigating the vessel with these harmonious euphonic tunes? Perhaps. But they've, command, they've commanded the lonesome spirit to carry them as far as the equator. Under the keel, nine fathom deep from the land of mist and snow, the spirit slid, and it was he that made the ship to go. So it's almost, I don't know, teleporting it or moving it somehow um, by supernatural powers. Okay. The sails at noon left off their tune, and the ship stood still also. So when they stop singing, it stops. So uh, when you stop praising nature, you'll create stasis. When you stop respecting, eulogising the natural world through, you know, harmonic prayer or, or worship, then life stops. So it's part of the continuation of things for you to continue to be 
deferential, reverential towards the natural world, and as such, God, or any other alternative spirituality. The sun, right up above the mast, had fixed her to the ocean, but in a minute she danced over a short, uneasy motion. Backwards and forwards, half her length of a short, uneasy motion. I guess readers are asked to picture the galleon ride at uh, various theme parks. It's rocking like this, forward and backwards half. Okay, and which is key. Um, then like a pawing horse let go, she made a sudden bound. So it, it leaps forward, it flung the blood to my head and I fell down in a swound. So almost we're invited to picture the mariner being thrown backwards and through, I guess nowadays we describe G-force, forcing him to sort of faint because the vessel is travelling so fast. I mean, this is, uh, th this is trippy stuff, really. I mean, it, it is inviting us to consider supernatural means of transportation, which people in, in 1798 are, un are unlikely to be able to comprehend. But it is in it's intoxicating in what Coleridge is trying to describe. How long in that same fit I lay, I have not to declare, but ere my living life returned, and I heard in my soul discern two voices in the air. So, while the mariner is asleep, the, 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 the ship can move, and he doesn't know how long he's been out. But again, it's very liminal, this blend between the conscious and the unconscious, this peripheral hinterland of the subconscious. The polar spirits, fellow demons, the invisible inhabitants of the element, take part in his wrong, and two of them relate, one to the other, that penance, long and heavy for the ancient manner, have been accorded to the polar spirit who returneth southward. So, we, we know that the, the lonesome spirit required vengeance. Does he, by knocking out the ancient mariner, does he get his vengeance? Does he, you know, literally knocks him unconscious as punishment for the transgression of killing the albatross? Because the, the polar spirit returns south now, seemingly satiated by his vengeance and how the mariner has been punished. Has, uh, ha, this savage act of retribution has been put on the mariner. Possibly so, I and mean, there might be an overly masculine reading of, of the, this, this part. However, we introduce the two voices which then start part six. Now, modern uh, psychoanalytic readers might think of this as voices of the, his conscience. Um, it, ego, superhero, ego, or kind of two types of uh, morality. However, they could simply be, as Coleridge perhaps mainly intended, to be two voices appraising and evaluating the, the mariner's spiritual destination. Is it he, quoth he, is this the man, by him who died on cross, with his cruel bow he laid full low the harmless albatross? You know, is this the killer of the albatross? We've heard about him. He's offended the whole natural world. He's sort of legendary, infamous figure in this sort of the spiritual, supernatural world of the of godly cosmos within Coleridge's mind. Um, by him who died on cross, is this him by Christ? You know, is that a, you know, is that a slightly taking the Lord's name in vain remark, but it seems to be a reference to Jesus. The spirit who biddeth by himself in the land of mist and snow. He loved the bird that loved the man who shot him with his bow. <laughs> um, it's almost as if the polar spirit, the, the lonesome spirit from the South Pole, was, was loved the albatross, was friends with the albatross, was part of the sim similar narrative, uh, natural frame of reference with the, the albatross. He loved the bird that loved the man. You know, you killed the albatross, you killed his best friend. He wants... He wants retribution, he requires vengeance. Because you've offended the natural order of things. It's almost karmic, uh, in almost like a Buddhist way of that, that we're all related in, in, in terms of reincarnation, etc. The other was a softer voice, as soft as honeydew. Quoth he, the man have penance done, penance more will do. It's interesting that when you, it's, it leads you up to think that when the voice is soft and full of honeydew, you, readers can be forgiven for thinking that it's going to be no, um, yes, he did kill the albatross, but uh, come on, he suffered enough, let's get him home. But it doesn't say that. It says he will suffer more. So it's almost sort of passive aggressive, <laughs> still quite sinister there at, at, at the end of this part. So again, we're, we finished the part with the idea of penance, responsibility, punishment, the idea that. He, the mariner has suffered, but must continue to repay his debt to nature. Okay, it's not society or human law he's offended. It's it's the divine law of nature, of Gaia, of Mother Nature, and the the natural forces of the element which he has transgressed and still must 
repay his debt.